Sorry about that small announcement, but Zoom tends to do that. Um, <laughs> welcome to this uh, great episode of Inside the Outhouse. Um, and we're very lucky to have uh, one of the Outhouse's uh, advocates and uh, champions, I guess, in the form of Laurie Mode uh, from Outdoors New South Wales ACT to uh, talk to us all about NOAC and also uh, throw her opinion <laughs> into throw her opinion into this conversation about uh, what motivates us as professionals in the outdoors. Um, right now, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to throw over to Cherie to do an acknowledgement of country and then we'll get into the discussion. Thanks, Cherie. Hey, everyone. Um, I wanted to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of land on which we are all gathering. Um, and pay our respects to elders past and present. Um, I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Thanks very much for that, Sheree. Um, I guess our first burning question off the top of the, uh, the list, and it's a bit of a throw up to the uh, fact that uh, just before we went on to the recorded part of the session, Laurie was telling us that uh, only five more people can be going to the actual NOAC conference coming up at the end of September, um, which is a, just a, an outstanding outcome for the outdoor sector, I think, and uh, looking forward to that conference. But our first burning question is, as NOAC 2022 is soon coming up and 250 delegates are going to attend, do conferences provide such as this, to provide us with professional motivation. Let's have a bit of a comment about that. You want it from anyone, Pete, or do you want to? <laughs> I'm happy to start. <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Why don't you start? No worries. Let me get rid of that phone call. Um, Look, I, I think exactly um, what you're saying around professionalism and, and, and motivation to, to improve professionalism, these events are a great driver of that. And it's about the camaraderie and the connection of, of peers. When they come together, they seem to boost that that morale and that willingness to sometimes look out the outside the box a little bit and actually have um, a little bit more forethought into um, doing things a little bit differently. So I think it does go a long way towards inspiring professionalism, but inspiring professional development. And Dave Chitty, you had your hand up. Do you have a comment on that? Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I tend to go to conferences. I think that... Uh, apart from the sessions, uh, the networking and, uh, and the ability to see what other people are doing in other parts of states or Australia, pretty important. I do think, however, post-COVID and with our new communication systems up and running, that perhaps we need to look at what conferences we're doing across Australia for the various sectors of the outdoor industry and why we're doing them. Yeah, maybe uh, we need to change the focus for the future um, rather than just say we've always done them that way. Uh, you know, have a look at what national, state and uh, activity or organisational conferences. We might be able to combine some or change the focus a bit and still and improve rather than uh, just do what we've always done. Mm. Do other people have a comment on what Dave just said there? Yeah, Pete, I agree. I, I think it's it's also about how do we combine the um, the online platforms such as the wonderful outhouse and the other opportunities that we have, the different forums. Um, but there, I think there still is a place for the conference. I think it's also a place for people from across our profession and other professions that have similar touch points to actually share learnings and to share experiences with their colleagues and and also just just those those interactions that are so valuable and I think you only get so much out of it in the online space we can do a lot and we have done a lot in the last few years on this space and even before COVID like we'd started doing a few webinars I think 
Australia is a big country, we know that, um, but it's, it's great to have those connections online and make it convenient and make it accessible for more people. But I think there's still a place for the actual, you know, the, the gathering and the, mm. the, those comments and those interactions that, that don't really happen online as well. And I, I really think there's a, there's a good place for that. I just wanted to add that um, I think we are, we are all experiential learners being in the experiential field. So I think having that, um, it's very important for us, I think in the long run to have that tactile in-person um, mm -hmm. experience. And I think that's one thing that's probably been lacking the past few years. And it's probably one of the things that's kind of um, led a lot of people to leave as well. I think the outdoor field is because they haven't felt that camaraderie or that, that, um, that feel like they're actually in it um, because it's all online and that becomes mm -hmm. very difficult for people who who need that um, to touch, to see, to feel everything. So I think mm -hmm. it's great that we're getting back into it. It's interesting. Uh, over, I've been running conferences now for about 25 years. Um, yes, I'm that old. <laughs> um, literally every time I do a survey the first thing that comes back is always around the networking that's the benefit the biggest thing that always comes back is the networking opportunity second it's the content <laughs> so it's interesting to see we go for the content mostly but we come away with that and that's why I think the the networking aspect and that camaraderie ship that develops inspires that development as well mm. It's such a relationships-based yeah. sector, I think. Mm -hmm. I just uh, always think that. I, I think it's a relationships-based uh, sector in which we uh, like to have close personal relationships with our, our students and peers. Mm -hmm. I think the other yes. spot on that, oh, sorry, no, uh, I was going to say, the other spot on that, what Laurie just said about the content and then the networking is you can write a business case about the content of what you're going to go and see, but you can't really write a business case to justify investing in going to a conference based on networking. Mm. But you probably should be able to in our world, as Cherie yes. said. But <laughs> I think it's easy to say, oh, I'm going because of these wonderful presenters, you know, but it's also I'm going to to interact with my peers and learn stuff. You know, mm. it, that's that's a different conversation. Sorry, David, I'll cut you off. Oh no, oh good, Dom. No, thanks. And no, I agree with all the all, all the comments because it is about relationships and it is we are in a very relational industry with our clients and with um, whoever they may be. And building that rapport in the field is is an important part of our work. Uh, but I also think the, the conference provides that focus point, and I know we've chatted about this on, on other forums, but the focus point for why. Why are we doing this? Mm. What, what educational benefits are, are in this? What social and emotional development um, and what mental health benefits are in it? And I think that's, that's a really wonderful way for us to express that and, and share those ideas in a face-to-face in a -face way. So, so it's very exciting. David, did you have something to add or is your hand up from before? No, I, I've got something to add. I also think that uh, in the last couple of conferences I've been to, the camps and the Victorian one, and no doubt this one, as there are little side meetings starting to happen, uh, getting groups of people together, whether formally or informally or individuals that wouldn't be able to come together in real time to discuss controversial subjects or the way forward or whatever. So there's opportunities in a face-to-face -face con conference such as NOAC or a state-based conference to, to add other things that you can't add to a, uh, to a virtual situation. I think some of my members on screen know this, but if others don't, there's one thing that I'm want to start pushing certainly in, in New South Wales and the ACT is the concept around what sort of development opportunity we give our members and we had a masterclass last year which was a very solid um, intense day of content where it's really about the development aspect conferences tend to be that that camaraderie ship and, and little bits of ideas and thoughts 
what I'd love to see in the outdoors is a symposium where we get down and dirty <laughs> on what are the solutions to some of our problems. And we we touched on that with the OCA summit. Um, that was a great start, but I think I'd love to see, you know, down the track a, a symposium of sorts to really drive, you know, action, outcome and uh, involvement. The other one that's interesting on that, when you talk about the different options, is the, the ABAT forum. And the, the for their, the ABAT forum is deliberately called the forum because they consider it to be an exchange. It's an exchange yeah. of ideas and it's an exchange of experiences. And I've been to uh, the one that was up here in Queensland a little while back, and it was it really was a genuine exchange from ABAT. So theirs is is another good one, and it's going ahead again uh, in October as well in South South Australia. So that's great to see another face to face gathering I won't say conference because they deliberately don't use the term um something I'm really curious about Laurie if you can answer or if you know um what's the age for rackets for participants that's not a question we ask them on their registration form <laughs> And, and being new to the industry, I don't know everyone yet. <laughs> so, but I, I'm going to guess it's probably quite diverse. I mean, the, the volunteers that we've got, my youngest volunteer is 15. Um, so there's our youngest participant. Um, and through to the oldest, Dave, I'm not looking at you. It may not be you. <laughs> um. <laughs> but, yeah, no, there is a, a very diverse range, but I couldn't tell you what sort of, yeah, whereabouts the average falls. It'll be interesting to find out. Um, I think a lot of places, I think you can take those types of questions for demographic purposes, <laughs> um, but uh, it would be really interesting to see the type of people and the age range of people who are coming to conferences to see if there's, um, I'm really interested to see how many younger people are coming yeah. and interested. We'll in yeah, we'll certainly, we'll certainly get that on the post event feedback. So I can certainly report back on that after everyone fills out their wonderful survey to tell me how wonderful the conference was and how awesome time they had. <laughs> I reckon the other one that's going to be interesting, particularly for this year for NOAC, is going to be the geographic range mm. going along that line of, of where people are coming from. Like I, I know quite a few people from Queensland are uh, heading down to the Blue Mountains to for this one. And, um, you know, I know if, if there was quite a few you know at previous ones but uh, I think it'll be really interesting because I think there is that demand that we talked about before. Mm, it is actually quite diverse and, and WA included there's quite a few coming over. Mm. It, it's it, that's a good question because in some years ago at the uh, at the NOAC that was held in Adelaide um, David Strickland looked at me and said uh, who's not here and I looked around and said oh well, you know, everyone from the outdoor education world's here. And he said, yes, he said, uh, he said, but there aren't the, we haven't got the principals and we haven't got the government agencies. We haven't got the non-believers coming mm. uh, that we could educate. We've actually got all the believers. And uh, he felt that in that conference context anyway, that perhaps we should, uh, yeah, be other people. And maybe that's the question, not for NIST, for NOAC, for, for conferences generally, when we work out what the new series of conferences for the next decade or two might be, is who are we actually targeting mm. and how do we, what barriers are there to certain types of people coming, young people, for instance, that leaders, people that might not be able to afford a lot of money. How do we, if, if we need them there, how do we get them there? Good point. Yeah. But, I, but I think we need to also be mindful of the fact that conferences are a sharing of professional learnings and knowledge and wisdom and shouldn't necessarily be used as a perhaps promotional sort of venue for what we do. In saying that, oh, that's I, why I make sure I get the politicians there so at least they hear yeah, about. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I brought that up to a few people that, for instance, in a, say, a profession with academics, you know, outdoor, in education academics and that, People need a forum where they can do that level of professional development, present papers and the like. Yeah? So we do need to look at what the needs of the various uh, parts of our industry are, not just outdoor education, and say, how do we meet all of those various needs? And I guess that's my concept of let's look to the future, mm. see what we need to do, and then design a new series of things to meet all those needs. 
You know, I think one of the needs right now is actually the chance to come together and have over two or three days people actually talking about the really good things that are happening in the outdoors and giving people a sense of self-worth mm. and the value of the contributions that so many people have been doing for so long. Like, But just right now, I think after the last couple of years, which, have, you know, our industry has been belted as so many others have. Mm. And I reckon there's actually just that piece of, reflecting on those contributions and reflecting on the changes that our people in and workers across the outdoors, whether it's outdoor education or adventure therapy or um, outdoor rec or adventure tourism, mm -hmm. those contributions to the experiences that people have and the, the value that people have for it. I think there's actually just value in that, in hearing that for a couple of days and not have, and stepping out of the, general day-to-day -day hectic lives that we tend to have. You're so true, Dom. I mean, we again and again, um, I, I talk to businesses, you know, not only just in the outdoors, but it's that chance to stand on that balcony and sort of look at your business from fresh eyes because you're so in it all the time and doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, that simple couple of days just to get outside excuse the pun um but you know you can literally just look at the new business a little bit differently or your operations a bit differently and just take a bit of a fresh approach and and laurian on that uh it was really good to see at the vic outdoors conference the minister for education there mm -hmm. although he turned up way too overdressed, uh, but, uh, but 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 we can brief the or you can brief the politicians how to dress for an outdoor conference. Uh, but but it's exactly that it shows that oh they actually they actually really care about our industry and it's a nice it's a nice thing to have mm. and they and the Vic industry we know that it was set up a long time before um, the industry in certainly New South Wales, mm. uh, but to see that level of support from um, the education department was really good and I think a really positive thing yeah it was do people uh in the room let's hear from some people who perhaps haven't uh given their opinion but uh the people in the room what other uh motivation how else do they develop as professionals besides attending conferences what are, what other mo what other things motivate you professionally? Uh, I think it's those concepts of community of practice. So often, uh, it's those smaller coming together um, sort of moments where you might just now have like a Zoom conversation with three or four dedicated people that you talk to. So um, that, you know, and in many ways, the best PD I often have is actually on recce's with staff. So having some time where I'm out in the field with either contracting new staff into where I'm working or, or getting that opportunity to go along and follow someone else's program and see how they, they're doing things. I tend to find that's probably the chance away from students, away from any sense that I've had to prepare something or thinking about how I'm presenting. I'm actually just, uh, you know, in the field with a group of people or or having that opportunity to have a conversation. Like today, for example, I met with an academic and it was just over lunch and we had that chance to talk about a whole range of things without an intent of any particular purpose. And uh, I find that's probably the stuff that reinvigorates and recharges me more than most things. And sort of sitting down to some bald headed academic like myself blabbering on about something. So, you're not booking out your session, Brendan, by saying that. Sorry. You're not booking out your session by saying that. Oh, look, I've been going to these for years. I've never had a booked out session, Laurie. My very first one was uh, empty because everyone was going to Pete Martin next door to me. So, I'm fairly aware of uh, where I sit in the, in the rung of people. That's all right. <laughs> And then I have certainly enjoyed hearing your presentations in the past and your contributions. And I would agree uh, that that contact with people is one of the biggest advantages of any, any PD um, and a lot of the inspiration and even something as simple as working with someone different, uh, working with someone new, working in pairs, 
in your space for your organization or working with different organizations always reinvigorates me. Um, I've had the joy of that in my current workplace where I'm no longer primarily an outdoor educator, but I get to go then work with outdoor educators from time to time. And I'm continuously inspired and learning things from them every time. Thanks very much for those thoughts, Ellen. I would bring up the fact that the other thing that probably motivates me uh, professionally is doing personal trips with just friends, family, relatives, and loved ones, and just enjoying the outdoors as a space, um, not necessarily as a workplace. What do other people think about that? Do you really do that, Pete? Or every time you go in the outdoors, are you scoping it out as a potential um, trip? It's always tax deductible, Dom. <laughs> always. That wasn't my question. I find it actually quite hard sometimes. Like if you go to a spot that you've never been before, I literally, this is terrible. This is as a, as a former land manager. I am looking at the facilities with a quite a critical eye whenever I go somewhere. I'm looking at, oh, are the trails well maintained? All this sort of thing. And you think, chill out, like actually enjoy the place. I'm not at work right now, but it's actually a hard mindset to switch off, I reckon. Yeah, I'm always doing emu bobs at campsites. <laughs> like me in event venues. <laughs> I think uh, I think it, it is true, Dom. It's difficult, and uh, I think maybe we were having this conversation where we last a week, Pete, or someone else having this conversation with that idea that we probably don't have the time and space. Like if you go back to the early '90s, and maybe there's a group of certainly uh, outdoor professionals working in Queensland that were often out doing lots of things together, and um, you know we probably don't have that time and space now as much as we used to, kind of pushing the boundaries and often having those sort of ethics. Um, that maybe, you know, the new ones coming into the field can look up and look at and see that the, the older ones are doing these things. I'm not sure, but there is a bit of a sense that maybe that's missed or a, there's not the space for it as, as what they used to be, which is a bit of a shame. I have it on good authority, Munch. There still are a few outdoor frothers in an age group, uh, you know, younger than me. No one's commenting, Pete. <laughs> uh, well, I've been on a few adventures with both of those boys, and I can um, vow, uh, uh, you know, I guess, um, yeah, think they're still out there doing it. But I guess it's it's easy to, um, you know, operate in your own sort of, you know, silo in regards to, you know, your organisation and sort of continue just to do the, the normal things that you, you do. Um, but I always kind of go back to those sort of, you know, ad cell teacher standards of, you know, we need to have professional knowledge, we need to have professional professional practice, and we need to sort of, you know, have professional engagement. And I think, you know, the conferences over the years have been a, a great sort of, you know, whole country gathering that you've got, you know, a diversity of people, you've got a diversity of streams of kind of activities. And Laurie, I know that you know, there's a hell of a lot of, you know, planning and work and effort that goes into creating a conference. And, you know, then it's really up to the individual to when they go there to get as much perceived value as possible. So, you know, by choosing the stream that you want to go to, by then, you know, having those, you know, quiet, you know, hallway conversations with other people that you don't sort of see too often, I think is the, the what and the why of conferences and that, you know, I think over the last, you know, period of time, I think I've, I've always gotten a great deal of value from, from going to those. Um, one, of, one of the areas that um, I'm sort of working in is that RTO space and they're sort of saying to assessors now that, you know, how do you, how do you maintain your currency or prove that you're current in that teaching area? Um, and I think, you know, attending events like this is something that's really quite easy to, to prove or do. Does anyone want to comment on what Dan just said? Interesting thoughts. I've got a few things to say.
Oh, well, maybe I need to say a few things. I think, I, I think that opportunity, like um, I think what Dan's mentioned there, that idea of showing evidence of our sort of practice and our professional development is probably something that it's always tricky to do. But one thing I try and do every couple of years is go back and work in a school. So I've got a sense of what's going on there. And maybe that's something we can facilitate. It's always hard to give up a staff person to go off and be in another organisation for a while, but that would at least show relevancy of practice and understanding how others are practising in your field. Mm. So it's um, how that can be facilitated. But I agree with that notion that it does, you do need to sit back and, you know, those conferences, especially when you're drawing in that national perspective, it does give you that chance to see a bit more broadly what everyone else is doing and, you know, consider your own practice. I think as an industry, we could do more in the way of uh, some sort of mentoring program. And I, I would suggest to do it well, it needs a level of formality about it. But I, but I think there's a lot of knowledge uh, which you, can be passed uh, through the sector. And I think we could do a little better with that. Yeah, I agree. That sort of knowledge navigation is kind of, you know, there's so many, there's so much out there to learn that we need to then work out what what are the important things. I someone mentioned earlier that, um, you know, maybe there could be like, you know, a general sort of, you know, theme of how we do conferences, and you know, is there a sort of a a survey of, you know, industry and how do we get those politicians and other people to sort of attend. Um, and then sort of, you know, carry on whatever was sort of achieved in the Blue Mountains on to do. Is it Western Australia where it goes to next or to the next, you know, state body that... You'll find out on the 28th when we announce it. (laughs) Absolutely. No, you're right, Dan. And and to your point earlier around, um, you know, choosing the right program, and this is a bit of a plug for NOAC as well, for the last five tickets, um, every paid attendee will have all audio recordings from every session. So if you want to go to two at the same time, you'll be able to download the second one post-event. It'll just be the audio, but you'll have the PowerPoint or whatever was presented at the time so that you can um, experience other streams that you wanted to see. So, Laurie, if no one turns up to mine or Brendan's, we're still going to go ahead with it. Is that Correct. What That's exactly oh, for right. goodness sake. <laughs> there goes our plan, mate. <laughs> You're not going to the pub at that time. As long as they can now, they can filter out the uh, the pub noise in the background. Dorm, it's going to be okay. Yeah, he'll be on the other side of the bar somewhere, but uh, we'll be right. Um, well, people need to understand that I'm presenting, so I think relative to those two people mentioned before, people will be attending their presentations. <laughs> In all seriousness, but that's that is awesome to have the recordings because mm-hmm. it also means even if you're at that um, that presentation, mm. you, you get listen. another chance to go back and have a have a listen to it, even in reflection, assuming you find time to do it, because there's <laughs> going to be um what however many hours of presentations to catch up on at some that's point. Right. But um, mm. you know, that's actually a really that's a valuable resource as well that that um yeah. for for the whole industry. So. <laughs> I think that's that's terrific, Laurie. Yeah. Mm. I wanted to video record them, but the budget just did not stretch that far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there's there's lots of ways we can do our own personal professional development uh, and you know, remain current and 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 learn things. I mean, one of the things I like to do, I've got a network of people, as you're aware, Laurie, from 20 year olds, yeah, through to people like uh, Alistair MacArthur and. Uh, uh, Tony Carden, yeah, who have sort of not in the industry formally anymore, but but who I would talk to at least three or four times a year, yeah, about um, because I think a their previous knowledge is important, um, and uh, yeah, we can't afford to lose those people that have been in positions. But also, I want to deal with younger people who are bringing new ideas in, so that I'm not stuck in my. Uh, yeah, well, middle-aged world, I think, to be charitable, yeah. Another area that I find as well is, is trying some a new activity. And, and I did this last year when we got, uh, when my ski program got shut down, we the, all the mountains closed and I'd never cross-country skied and I'd avoided it and avoided it. 
And then my team and I, well, we just found some old cross-country skis and decided to go out uh, just with our staff. So going back to um, what Brendan was saying before about those, those PD opportunities when you actually do a recce, this was very similar to that sort of recce that we were doing. And I was so outside my comfort zone. Um, I've skied downhill since I was five and here I am falling over every second step. But it was great because I now start to look at new activities again with that fresh set of eyes and going, okay, well, what are my kids who I'm teaching thinking when they're starting something new? What are other people thinking coming in as a client to doing this? And, and I found that really good as just part of that professional development process. I use the same thing from a risk management point of view. Um, we take our leader team up to places like we Jasper go caving or Bucken where we don't operate and go caving because uh, as a, as just as semi recreational, I'll pay the bills. Yeah, um, but you get used to operating where you do things all the time. And sometimes it's nice to go somewhere else where the risks are different. We have to think you've got to learn from the locals. Uh, yeah. And, and that sort of thing. So that can be, we bring a lot. I, I feel we're a lot safer in what we do regularly by going elsewhere occasionally. Mm. I was thinking about the mention of mentoring before and it brought back um, a memory from, I think it was Aysward WA. So teaching uh, organization back in WA that offered all members the opportunity to join a mentoring program either as a mentor or as a mentee so you could nominate which one you wanted to be and they provided a framework so they they provided the opportunity to match you to like a mentor and a mentee and then they provided a framework in which to follow in that process and then you were left to make that process happen as you were motivated as an individual to make it happen or not make it happen. And it was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, they, they, like teachers all across Western Australia were given the opportunity to work with each other. And I think that's something that could be leveraged in the outdoors as well. For people in New South Wales, you probably know we've got two programs happening at the moment that do exactly that, Ellen. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> they're beautiful opportunities. Mm. Yeah, we've got uh, a great bunch. They've got New South Wales and ACT running concurrently, but we've got facilitated sessions that go throughout the whole six months, but they're put together for six months and we give them topics to talk about with each other if they need it or they just go off on their own and work out problems and solutions and <laughs> yeah it's working well graduation's coming up soon i wish i knew about that earlier <laughs> that's right next one's october put your name down <laughs> i was just going to ask if you were going to be running in a second one yeah i'll put the link in the chat hold that thought thanks very much laurie sounds like a great program it's a bit of fun well, Dave's one of our mentors, so you can ask him. I'm a bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the other area that uh, I'm fiddling with at the moment uh, in Victoria well, is some industry leadership. Um, a, a little pilot I'm, I'm playing with, with um, David Strickland from Sport and Recreation, perhaps funding something later on. And one of the things I've noticed, we, we don't, we get really good young people that kick, you know, kick around at conferences or activities or um, you know, in operations, but we don't give them those broader learning opportunities. Yeah? In other words, they might be an outdoor educator, but do they know anything about insurance or tourism or other things? So I'm sort of looking at, uh, uh, and as I've got a young lady doing my pilot, pilot at the moment of, 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 of exposing quality young leaders to a whole range of, uh, of um, sectors within the outdoor industry. So they've got to, you know, as they move through, they're not siloed anymore, at least in their thinking. Also sounds like a great program. Thanks for sharing. Uh, do you, if you had details, Dave, you could share those in the chat as well, if you like. What we'll do there is um, further along, 
I might get Chloe to um, yeah, maybe at the end of this year, early next year, to do a bit of a presentation on one of these uh, on inside the outhouses to how she saw the concept being developed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sounds fantastic. Um, Laurie, you had a, a bit of a hot off the press announcement to make, I so did. maybe you should hit us with that. All right. Well, first of all, I thought I'd just refresh everyone's memory with, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to drive a ship here. It's not working. Okay. Here we go. Turn it around. There we go. <laughs> It's uh, refreshing your memory on the program for NOIC. Um, and just reminding everyone, if you haven't already booked in yet for your pre-conference workshops to do so, um, a couple are getting to the point of um, full, but not yet. We've still got a few more. So yeah, don't stress if you can get in and book them. Um, but yeah, for those that are certainly in the nature play space, that's um, a great opportunity to get some great minds around the table in the nature play area. So the three are definitely got some more opportunities in case you're interested. Um, the hot off the press, I'll announce at the moment, but it's just after this welcome cocktail party. So I'll come back to that. We have, um, so Parsi Salberg, who is our, our guru when it comes to Nature Play, is our first keynote, but our second keynote you might have seen is Kai Fano, who um, is a uh, an award-winning stunt woman from um, overseas that started in the outdoors and she's back in the outdoors in Australia, so certainly one not to, to miss there. Here's all your beautiful names spread across the agendas here on all of the different topics and what's happening in um, in the concurrent sessions. Um, as we said, 61 sessions will be on offer, all available after the, uh, the event. We've got the beautiful uh, celebratory dinner with the Outdoor Education Program Awards, which we're going to be bussed over to Hydro Majestic Hotel, which uh, is going to be a sensational night with a beautiful welcome uh, by our, um, our local Aboriginal clan. Um, the next morning, we will have a workshop for those that are interested where we'll be serving breakfast. And this is um, a, instigated by my climate change subcommittee but they've asked all of the retailers and the, uh, the equipment manufacturers that are going to be at NOIC to come to this and help them in brainstorming what are the changes we're going to need in apparel and equipment as we enter climate change. So they've already started the discussion, but they wanted to open it up to the whole industry and start really brainstorming some of the opportunities that we might have in simple changes to some equipment and apparel because we know it's here to stay now. Um, then, yeah, into the last day, we've got some, again, some amazing speakers, uh, Tom and Stephanie Potter from overseas and Deb Ajengo live um, via Zoom, and then into our concurrence again, finishing off uh, with the, so I've been set, told, the infamous Bo Miles, um, who's going to entertain us in that last session before we announce the individual awards for the Outdoor Education Australia um, 2022 awards. Don't forget the following day, there is a link on the website to book your, um, your outdoor experience. So that is done separately to all of the different operators. So as to know not to confuse, um, you can jump on that link and book your, your uh, experience on the Thursday. But let me share with you what's happening on Monday night. So apparently you guys might be familiar that you often run a movie night um, as part of NOIC. And hot off the press, this is what you have the opportunity of seeing. I think it brings out of a lot of like those really beautiful traits of being a woman when you're like surrounded by that whole like feminine energy. It's just, yeah, you kind of don't like hold anything back. Courtesy of Adventure Entertainment, 
um, you will get to see their latest release and you'll all get a copy of the September Wild Magazine in your kits as well. So there you go. That's the movie night on Monday night. We'll be providing popcorn for those going in. <laughs> it's very exciting. I'm very excited about that. That looks like a, I was, uh, it keep, for some reason, it keeps coming into my email feed, but I'm very excited to see that. That's cool. Um, wow, that's very exciting. And popcorn as well. Part, <laughs> oh, that's part, what makes Butter it. and salt or sweet? <laughs> oh, the extra butter. The extra butter. Uh, extra butter, right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Any questions, happy to answer them as well. But yeah, um, certainly coming together quite nicely. So, Laurie, I have a question. Sure. The um, the sessions on the Monday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Do do we need to book in? Are they an extra that we need to book in for? The pre conference yes. workshops are yeah. So the ones from yeah. twelve thirty to three. Okay. Mm. Cool. You can see, so, check it out on the website. Yep, I'll put the link in the chat for you, and I'll just show. <clears throat> I uh, just so you know too if people are trying to book accommodation the accommodation is no longer available on the website you'll need to email us because of availability cool. so just when you go into the conference you go click on tickets that'll take you straight into the booking for the event like you all have done um and then down here you'll see pre oops sorry my fault pre-conference one two and three so your third one is playmio with mark collard one and two um number one is claire dallet number two is parsi amanda and christian for the nature play which you'll see in the chat <laughs> there you go so i'll put the link in there for you if you oh, want to book you. for those yeah. Thanks for that, Laurie. No um, does anyone have any further comment on how we develop professionally? Um, while I have the mic, I would just like to uh, give a small plug to... Uh, this, this uh, fine forum inside the outhouse, I will be presenting on our activities at uh, the national conference. Um, so if you're interested in this project and where it's gonna go, then there'll be more to be said at that event. Um, professionalism, but let's talk it. Dom, you have your hand raised? I do, Sheree. It's a little bit of a professional plug, but um, one of the ways I was just going to say, which you have two whole days left to nominate, but to recognise professionalism, one of the things that Outdoors Queensland does is the Outdoors Queensland Awards, and those nominations are still open until Wednesday. Um, so if uh, you're interested, um, or and particularly... I don't know how to say this, but there's always one category which, for some reason, we never seem to get deluged with applications, which is one I don't understand, which is actually the emerging outdoor uh, contributors or the, the newcomers. And um, we still have, we've, we have received some nominations, but we'd love to have more for that one particularly. So if anyone is interested, um, I'll share the link in there. If you know someone who's new to the outdoor world, um, yeah, nominations are still open and I would love to see some, I want to make it really hard for the judges as we always, uh, as it normally is. But what do you guys think of um, where do awards come into um, that sort of space as far as professional recognition? Is there a space for awards? I, I think there are. I think maybe what we need to do as many professions other professions, other industries do is actually define what professional development means. Yeah, uh, yeah, at various levels of our um, our careers and the sorts of things that young people, newcomers, would be encouraged to attend, uh, and the sort of things that uh, managers and operators or academics or others. But I, I think awards are certainly a part of the 
of any um, any professional development system. I concur. I think it's good to recognise people uh, in the profession, in the sector, who are who are gurus, I guess, for want of a better word, um, experts in the field of our practice. And I think that's a good thing. But they can also provide rites of passage yeah, for younger people moving up. Yeah, maybe award is not the right term there, but uh, you know, recognition along the way can encourage people to stay in an industry, you know, to, uh, to maybe aspire to a higher position or learn things. I think it goes along with that um, idea of feeling connected uh, to a group of people and having recognition for the work that you've put in, I think make, plays such a big part. We know that's really important in any job that you do. So I think definitely in the outdoor space as well, it's, it's really good to have recognition for, for all your hard work and um, yeah, just different aspects of that. I think the tricky thing we run into is that by nature, probably most of the people in our field aren't sort of people that go about spruiking their own wares too much and uh, even when you go and tap them on the shoulder they're like nah someone else is probably going to be better than me no nah, maybe not maybe next year that sort of scenario so that's always tricky but I guess um, potentially those that are at those senior levels just have to take it on ourselves just to keep nominating people and uh, pushing through so I've got two for you Dom don't worry I've got a couple more coming your way just like any good uni person I'm procrastinating and haven't got it to you yet so sorry so Awesome, mate. Look forward to seeing them. I agree with you completely, Brendan. I think the industry is full of very humble people um, and it is important to celebrate. But I think that is one of the things that we that holds us back. We tend to be like us, oh, you know, like not us. Um, I've got an need- idea, Alan. I think we should have an award for the most humble person and everyone has to nominate themselves. <laughs> yeah and outdoors queensland you guys have done a great job over you know a long a long period of time to have those award dinners and it's not just about the award but it's also you know people coming together you're celebrating you know your role and what you're doing you're celebrating other people's success and you always do a pretty good sort of uh you know video sort of narrative of different people's you know programs and what they do and what they're into so you know, I think there's a level of engagement sort of there and there's a, you know, a social sort of aspect to those dinners as well. It's always quite rewarding to attend. So, yeah, good on you, Dawn. Um, I think that's uh, something that maybe one thing we can do as in, uh, individual businesses and stuff is is this idea of um, providing feedback. And, you know, we talk about constructive criticism. Well, that includes the positive and being able to constructively, um, you know, tell people what they're doing good and, and kind of tell them, or even a li- this idea of self, um, uh, gosh, I can't think of the word. It's mama brain, I swear. But um, when you, when you have to rate yourself, um, like giving feedback on yourself, I think is really important. And it's a really important aspect of um, the workplace is being able to kind of understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. So I think us <laughs> promoting that with our, um, with our staff and stuff is really important. Um, not just as the higher up, but um, all the way down to the on the ground um, newbies. Well, Sheree, you're doing well with your wrangling there and making sense while you're doing it too with your assistant. She's she's a very cute assistant, so. <laughs> I think I think I just add uh, we also need to be open to. Uh, getting feedback uh, from others, whether that is positive or otherwise. Yeah, and that's a cultural change, Pete. I think we work really hard on it in our students, um, but many of us are still learning it ourselves. Laurie, did you have something your hand is up? Yeah, just to uh, take it back a step, I'd love to know what people think is professionalism. <laughs> Maybe I'll begin by saying learning to spell the word professionalism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that your other mistake? I didn't see that one. 
<laughs> well, uh, uh, Spare David would probably uh, suggest that one of the core characteristics of a professional is they turn up to things. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, David? Exactly. Yeah. The, the world is run by those who turn up. And so I think it's, uh, it's an important trait. <laughs> It's interesting what professionalism is, because um, someone called me um, as a as a reference for a candidate to um, you know do some outdoor ed work at a like a prestige sort of Brisbane school, and um, you know th th this guy you know has sort of funny nickname. He's got kind of long hair, and you know he doesn't look particularly you know professional, but. You know, I kind of, sort of said, well, you know, when we take his boat out, you know, the guy goes and warms it up for 45 seconds before we, um, you know, zoom off anywhere. And he's, you know, in a lot of other ways other than, you know, how you perceive him just by looking at him, he he can be very professional. And I guess, uh, yeah, sometimes I I um, reflect that, you know, our our outward sort of appearance, you know, can be, you know, in car keys and, you um, you know, a sloppy, you know, like a sun, a sun safe hat can maybe in some other environments not come across particularly professional. I don't know if anyone else has had that sort of experience or, or not, but some of my understandings. I think one of the, the key things is um, people who have aliveness and passion about what they're doing, that energy and enthusiasm stuff. I reckon that's the number one thing that comes in for any of that professional stuff. Nice. Unless you're too humble to, um, you know, explain that to others, <laughs> maybe it doesn't come across. I think when it comes to professionalism, it's more important, like you're saying, about the the person's attitude and how they um, carry themselves rather than necessarily what they look like. Um, I think that's a very social construct of our ideas and expectations of how we want. And um, I think. You know, hopefully the further along we get, the more we understand that, you know, people can look all different ways and it doesn't necessarily say anything about who they are as people. Um, so I think it's really important that we model the uh, not judging a book by its cover and what, what we have proved is acceptable and judging them based on their character <laughs> and um, how, they, how they interact with others. I think the other part of that too, Sheree, is you, you're a professional if you turn up ready to do the job. And if you turned up for an outdoor adventure wearing a three-piece suit and, um, and your nice um, uh, buff leather shoes, you're not actually turning up ready to do the job that you're there to do. So I think that's a form of professionalism is being prepared for what might come on that day and understanding what's involved in delivery of the services that you're there to do. And I reckon that's actually... You can sort of judge a book by a cover sometimes if people turn up with the wrong gear for the activity or, you know, the, the, they're actually not ready to go uh, when they get there. So I think you sort of can, you can, you can get, certainly get a good read on the book without actually opening that cover sometimes. Yeah, I think on that, um, I actually had a, um, a parent turn up to a parent uh, sun hike once and she was in a brand new pair of Prada shoes and she brought a shopping bag. To, uh, to to go on the three-day hike with us. So we, we had to equip her out to, with some gear. But uh, thankfully, we were set up on our part, but uh, I don't think she got the memo as to what exactly this was all about. I also think professionalism means different things at different levels and at, uh, within the industry, yeah? Um, yeah, but at the leader level, at management, uh, peak body, you know, CEOs and, uh, yeah, and uh, I think as we move up through the industry, probably it, professionalism should be more where we spend more time, we spend as much time working on other people's problems in the industry as we do trying to um, you know, move ourselves forward. Yeah? You, know, you put more in as you go up, whereas at the, at the junior level, you're probably trying to take more in and learn and experience. Yeah? So, we probably it's something we could probably look at defining in, at least loosely at some stage. Yeah. Ellen, your thoughts? Sorry, I think at a simple level, 
Professionalism is understanding the outcomes and the goals and meeting them efficiently, effectively and successfully. I mean, yeah. And there's many, many ways you can do that. And like David said, depending on what level you are, that means different things. I'm interested to ask an extension question because I always do this, sorry. <laughs> Where does ethics fall in professionalism? Hi. <laughs> so what I'm sort sorry. of ethics I shows think your professional aspects? Like if you think of... Like one of the things that we're attempting to do through the tertiary components is have these threshold concepts and it's that your capacity to link and work within those threshold concepts of what's expected to be a professional in the field and one of those is the social and ethical components of your profession. So, and what is a link to that is that guidance and understanding. So you can look across, you know, some of the areas that we teach across is this notion of, your, your qualification, socialization, and subjectification. And the socialization is that notion of being attuned to the ethics of your profession. So if you're aware of your social components and the ethics, norms, traditions, those sort of things are all encompassed within, within that. You're qualified to do things, but that doesn't mean that you're capable of doing them in an ethical way. Mm. Um, your discipline knowledge is connected to your subjectification or subject knowledge is crucial. But that socialization, that element of ethics, professional practice, understanding traditions, but also being willing and open to contesting some of those because not all traditions are, are you know, are off limits. We can mm -hmm. challenge them. And um, so ethics is crucial to that. Ellen? Coming at it from a purely educational point of view, we are often teaching or focusing on teaching like social behaviors, teaching um, well-being, uh, teaching appropriate social interactions. I would, you know, I would say often we are teaching morals and ethics and setting those standards and you should be leading by example mm. in those things. So to me, it, it rates really highly professionally. You should be role modeling and living those things how else can you teach them with a deep understanding? Mm, I think you just touched on one, but my follow-up question was going to be, well, which ones are non-negotiables? Which have we got to see in this industry as professionals that are not negotiable? Um, I think I'm, there's quite a few. Oh, sorry, you go. <laughs> yeah, I think integrity um, is a big part of that. Um, this idea of, um, you know, the believing what you're, what you're preaching is really important if you're going to teach people about the importance of the outdoors and then you won't treat it very respectfully and trash it then you know what kind of message does that send to anybody else um that idea of hypocrisy is yeah so integrity is very important i saw a good definition of integrity recently which was about it's the behavior you uh, engage in when when you don't think anyone else is watching and that's actually what it's all about, I reckon, as far as whether it's in the outdoors or any other aspect of um, life. Yeah. I, I, I think there's a couple of levels of it as well. So managerial ethics are going to be slightly different from your um, ethical approach when you're working with the clients. And um, as Ellen was stay, saying, when, when we're teaching that leave no trace in the field, the, that's ethics um, on one level, but then if you're responsible for a group of staff, then you do have a you must treat your staff in an ethical and appropriate way as a leader, because otherwise you won't end up with any staff. So your organisation is going to crumble and be unsustainable. So, so I, I think it is a very critical part of any organisation on, on on different levels. I think with our leaders and ourselves. On activities, for instance, at a simple level, if we require, for instance, that uh, the industry requires that you wear life jackets and helmets and do certain things, wear certain things and conduct yourself in certain ways and activities, then role modelling means you don't only just do that when you're working, but you do that when you're recreating. Yeah, 
in your own time with your peers because uh, you're setting that example. It's got to be a, it's got to be something you do all the time, not something you just do when the boss tells you you've got to do it or you've got a, a group. Uh, thanks for all your comments and great discussion. Uh, what an outstanding session. Um, we can continue to talk the ethics um, at Lib. I'm just going to stop the recording. Uh, my name's Pete Smith, uh, founder, orator, telemarker of Inside the Outhouse. And thanks very much for your participation. Uh, we'll see you all face to face in at NOAC 2022, uh, counting down 27 days, 19 hours, and 40 minutes to go. Feel free to stay and hang out and chat. It's less now. <laughs> if you want. <laughs>